welcome to episode 231 of School Librarians United. I'm your host, Amy Herman. This podcast is dedicated to the issues and challenges school librarians face every day. As a school librarian, having just finished my 16th year, I knew I wanted a podcast which addressed the nuts and bolts of running a successful library program. I don't claim to have the answers, but I hope that this is a platform to share resources and exchange ideas. Now is a perfect time to mention that all the ideas and opinions expressed in this podcast by myself, my interview guests, and listeners who reach out to the podcast are our own and do not reflect those of our school districts. When incorporating research, I always make sure to cite my sources. So whether you are a novice or a veteran school librarian, this podcast has something for you. I'd like to extend a very special welcome this week to everyone who is tuning in for the very first time. I introduced the podcast to many people when I was attending ALA's annual conference this past week. I welcome you and all listeners to reach out with your feedback and episode suggestions. You can reach me either on Facebook, on Twitter, my handle is at LMS underscore United, or the email address schoollibrariansunited at gmail.com. If you include your mailing address, I'll be sure to send you a podcast sticker. This past week, I attended American Library Association's annual conference. This year was held in Chicago. Believe it or not, this conference was a first for me. I was supposed to present at ALA in Chicago in 2020. Well, as you can imagine, like everything else that was canceled in 2020 after March 13th, I got an email, coincidentally, on the same day that the Summer Olympics were going to be postponed, and you don't forget details like this, informing me that the conference was canceled. I was so excited to be attending this year. I was especially curious to see what it's like as a school librarian attending our parent organization, a conference which represents all divisions of librarianship. I like in attending a national or state conference a lot like visiting Disney World for your profession. It is wholly immersive and it's nonstop until you take that minute to like internalize everything you've just encountered. You connect instantly with people you've only ever engaged with through social media, and now they're standing inches away from you. I sat at a table across from friends enjoying a glass of wine or a beer, when previously, the only ever time we had ever connected was through Zoom calls or remote recording sessions. What is so important is that we were able to solidify that collegial friendship And I know moving forward, we now have a stronger connection to school librarians, and I was so lucky to meet them while I was there in person. Conferences can be jarring, even overwhelming at times, but it's also transformative in the way that it'll continue to play out as I take what I learned and build on those connections that I made with the other attendees. I want to take this opportunity to extend a huge thank you to several people. First, Andrea and your entire family, thank you for opening your home to us. Your gracious hospitality knows no bounds. I am forever grateful. You are attentive to every detail, and you planned out all our excursions and meals to guarantee we truly got to experience Chicago. Amanda, I lost track of how many times you made sure to introduce me to everyone who actually wanted to just talk to you. And you would turn around and say, have you met Amy Herman? Her podcast has been downloaded in 148 countries. And that was all the introduction I needed to connect with perfect strangers in the library world. Wendy, if I ever get stuck in rush hour traffic again, I choose you as my co-pilot. I am forever grateful for your sense of humor and all the times you were just an important and fantastic listener. Dustin, I am so glad we got a chance to hang out. And Tom, count me in anytime you have a seat at your table. Dr. Jameson, thank you so much for inviting me to speak on your panel discussion. And to everyone I met at ALA this past week, thank you for allowing me to be part of your conference experience because you made mine unforgettable. Be sure to listen to episode 224. I announce a new sponsorship with Literati Book Fairs, and now is a chance to hear from former guest on the podcast and Literati Book Fair veteran, Amanda Chacon. Friends, I'm so excited. Amanda Chacon, thank you for joining us. Friends, we've got an expert with us because Amanda has hosted two book fairs. Thank you very much. Amanda, would you give us an idea where in the country you are and tell us a little bit about the students you support? Sure. So currently, I'm an elementary school librarian at a Title I school in Houston, Texas. 
We have around 600 students in grades one through five. Wow. And so tell me, how many teachers do you have in your building? We have around 65 teachers and close to 100 staff members. Oh, my gosh. Wow. So I, I'm curious because obviously the students get excited about the book fair. But can you give me an idea? And listeners are curious to know what is the response from your teachers and your staff? I mean, have you been able to also uh, bring them in uh, to enjoy and, and partake of the Literati Book Fair? Yes, and let me tell you why. That is because Literati offers a 20% discount to school staff without it coming out of your book fair profit. And if you are a librarian who has been doing this for a while, that is huge. So I was able to offer all of my staff a discount and they were they hear that and it's 20%, so it's not a small discount. And they were more keen to buy books for not just themselves and their families, but also their school libraries. What a smart thing to do, right? <laughs> because you really do, and, and word gets around, because I'll tell you, we teachers, we like our bargains, and we do like to be treated with some sort of like, you know, I don't know, th th this has got to be, you know, and right now we're recording this, it's Teacher Appreciation Week, and I know that everybody's offering discounts for teachers and because it's such a smart thing to do because people know that when teachers are spending money, they are invariably doing it to support the reading that's happening both in their homes and in their classrooms. I love that. And I got to be honest, I, I know that it's not unusual for sort of independent booksellers when they know that you're a teacher to extend those kinds of discounts. But I've not had that experience working with previous book fairs. I have not either. Um, it's always come out of my own profit. And, you know, it hurts a little bit to do that, you know, because it's like we work so hard for that profit. And then we want the teachers to come in and purchase. But again, it's like it's like bittersweet. But with Literati, it does not come out of your profit. So it's just kind of like, hey, you get it. I, I was just like telling everybody in the hallway, hey, you get 20% off. Come on in, come on in. And then because I was so excited, that enthusiasm, you know, is infectious. So I do have to ask because we can't ignore them. You know, there are administrators invariably are going to have an opinion about anything we do. And, and they'll usually be very vocal if this is something that is an inconvenience or it is perceived as something of a, you know, some, let's just get past this and you get, get over this. But tell me, have you had any sort of feedback when your administrators come by? Because they, pro I'm, I'm guessing your administrators have done at least a walkthrough when your book fair is going on session. What, what have you sensed that is the, the response of the administrators who are walking through those literati book fairs? That is so funny that you bring that up because the last one we had in April, my principal was in there two times a day, just walking through the book fair. She's just like, I just like it. It just feels good. And of course, I mentioned that um, we had a lot of Spanish titles and, you know, she was drawn to that and she was impressed with that. But overall, she was just like, I just like the feel of it. It just makes me feel good. So she would just kind of, you know, she's walking around the building doing principal things and she would just take a break in the book fair. And I just thought that was just really cool. And it just gives you that sense of there is this just like elegant bookstore kind of vibe to Literati. Well, and, and I know uh, that 20 percent will go a long way, especially if you start doing some of your holiday shopping or birthday shopping, or, you know, all, all the, the, the book buying occasions like, you know, baby showers and birthdays and holidays. So, oh, so smart. Amanda Chacon, thank you so much for joining us again. Friends, I'm going to put Amanda's social media contact in our show notes today. But thank you so much, Amanda. Thank you for having me. For those of you who are considering having a fundraiser this year, Literati Book Fair has a very generous offer. Librarians who book their first Literati Book Fair before July 31st for this upcoming fall and mention the code UNITED will receive a $500 gift card from Tidal Wave. As always, there's a link in today's show notes. And now a word from Capstone. Capstone is an innovative publisher and education technology provider of children's content for school libraries, classrooms, and at-home learning. Home of the award-winning PebbleGo Research Database, Capstone has a passion for creating inspired learning and intellectual curiosity in children, and I'm so excited to be working with them. 
I'm grateful to Capstone for their continued commitment to support the podcast in Season 5. They are offering listeners of School Librarians United a very special discount. Visit shop.capstonepub.com and use the code UNITED to get $20 off an order of $100 or more for both print and Capstone Interactive eBooks. That's code UNITED for $20 off an order of $100 or more for both print and eBooks on shop.capstonepub.com. And now for our episode, American Library Association's annual conference and my conversation with those I met while attending. Hi, my name is Lisa, and I'm an upper school librarian um, in Norfolk, Virginia. I've been at my school uh, for a year and a half, but this will actually be starting my 13th year as a school librarian. Best job in the world, as we all know. (laughs) So tell me, you know, you're here at this conference, you're taking time out of your summer to just invest in yourself as a professional. What are some things you're hoping to happen when you're here at the conference? Uh, This is my fifth time I've come to ALA. Um, I was once years ago on the AASL Best um, Web, uh, sorry, Best Apps Committee, so I came for that originally, but I love ALA. It's one of my favorite professional development times. You meet so many great people here. You can't be quiet. You have to talk to the people around you. I met this morning a wonderful lady um, who works with the military libraries. If you're not familiar with Norfolk, Virginia, it's the home of the world's largest Navy base. A lot of my students are military connected. Just by talking to someone on the bus, I got a great new resource for my military kids. It's things like that, that just the little tiny magic pieces that happen here. I mean, the sessions are great. The vendors are great. It's, it's so good to be around all sorts of different librarians. Don't limit yourself to school librarians because you learn so much from everybody else and what they're doing. Well, and I'm glad you mentioned the bus because, you know, if you've ever been to a large city going to a conference, the, it's very intimidating because if you can't see the conference center from your hotel room, you're like, how am I supposed to get there? And you're like, you know what? ALA, I think, did a fantastic job with their shuttles and uh, dedicated shuttles to each of the hotels. And so if you book your hotel through the website, you can be sure to get a bus ride and, and meet magical people. Exactly. And also, even if you have a hotel that's not that's near it, all the hotels don't have bus stops you just have to have a hotel near a bus stop wear your magical little ala tag and they'll let you on the bus it's fantastic absolutely so tell me you know you've been a librarian for a long time what are some things that you're exceptionally proud of things that you would love to share with listeners today so like i said i was on the ala um best apps committee um i'm going to give you fair warning when you see that thing to volunteer in the email, all you, they, they, they don't do a lot. You literally can just sign your name, tell them you're a librarian, you're excited, and they might, they might pick you to volunteer, which is really kind of scary because it's intimidating and you have that kind of, oh, is this, should this really be me? But it's so worth it to do that. And I've done that on my, in my state um, organization, my local organization, and I, I that is one of my favorite parts because you get to see what other librarians are doing what, and you get to see on the forefront of what's happening in either your national or your state or your local level. It's so exciting and great advice for everybody tuning in. I hope you have a great conference. Thank you so much. It was wonderful meeting you, Amy. I'm thrilled to be on your show. Julie Stivers. Oh, my gosh. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. You've had an incredible year. And um, just just share with listeners because it's your story. Wow. Um, I've had an incredible year. Um, like probably everybody listening, an exhausting year. 22, 23 has been tricky. Um, but I've been lucky. I've gotten some awards this year. <laughs> Amy knows I really don't like to talk about myself. Um, I'm the North Carolina Librarian of the Year, and then in the spring, I am the School Library Journal School Librarian of the Year. She is on the cover of the magazine. It is very exciting. And friends, I got to, I got to interview you twice. You've been on two shows, and, and they're absolutely phenomenal because, you know, the first one, you showcase so much work that you did in a book and, and the work that you're doing with your students. And, you know, I am just so grateful and I would love for you to give us an idea of what your goals are, because I believe you just changed jobs. I, um, yeah, I've wanted to work with high school students for a while, um, born from my love of working with my anime clubs, my remote anime clubs, my high school students. So I am moving to a high school 
Um, I'm not actually saying the name of it yet um, because it's still like nothing is official. Um, But I will be working with high school students, which I'm really excited about. I'm so glad for you because, you know, it's hard because when you you create a program and then you're like, you know what? I have done the things I want to do. And as a professional, this is an opportunity for you to grow and to really challenge yourself. Um, I'm curious, tell us a little bit, because you have some responsibilities here at the conference. I have very few responsibilities at this conference. But tell us, you happen to be here because you do have some connections. You have uh, affiliates. But let us know what other things have brought you to the conference in addition to just, you know, meeting and, and, and connecting with other librarians. Okay, Amy, you're not going to like the answer to this question. This is the first conference I've ever been to. I'm not presenting. I am actually not presenting. I know. It's, it's like at night, I don't know what to do with myself because I'm not writing my notes for my presentation the next day. <laughs> well, and pro tip, friends, for anybody who's considered presenting at a conference, just know that when you write that proposal, that thing hasn't fully hatched. That isn't fully formed. Our conference, like the actual presentation that we put together, it evolves between the time that you write that proposal and the time that they accept it. And then more importantly, I saw people working on their, their presentations during yesterday's opening keynote. I'm not going to lie and I'm not going to out this person because they're a very important leader in our, in our uh, field. But, you know, let me ask you, when you are here, what are some things you're hoping to do because you don't have to present? Um, it does feel a lot more open. I'm really excited about connecting with other librarians. Of course, I'm going to be in the exhibit hall a lot. Um, no matter what school I'm at, I'm going to be running True Book Fairs, which are all the books, none of the costs for students. So all of the books I get at conferences, ARCs, everything that goes into my um, True Book Fair hall. And it really helps like the kernel and the seed of growing my True Book Fair. So I'm really excited about getting books for students. So friends, we're going to make sure to, to put those links in the show notes. But you know, with your True Book Fair, I'm, I'm expecting, assuming that this is something you're going to continue in your, in your brand new digs. Yes. No matter what school I'm at, I will always have a True Book Fair. Um, and I'm super excited about um, going to the We Need Diverse Books, Band Books panel today at 2.30. Outstanding. Have a fantastic conference, Julie. Thank you so much. I'm Kate. I'm a teacher librarian in Southern California, and I'm out of high school. One of the things that I'm most proud of this year is we have a recording studio with a uh, roadcaster podcast system, and my IT department has been super helpful, and I had two girls at the beginning of the year come to me with a pitch for a podcast club. Oh, no way. Oh, that's fantastic. So I, I, when you ch- get to channel that kind of student excitement, no, I want to know more. So this is at the beginning of the school year. Were you able to like hit the ground running? What, what were your next steps when the students came to you? So these were two girls in my, one was in my husband's English class and they pitched it to him, but he was already advising the club. But he was like, go over, see Miss Appleby in the library. Like, I think she has equipment, talk to her. They came in with a Google slide deck for their presentation, what types of podcasts, what they wanted theirs to be. These are two girls that hadn't felt connected to our school, and so they wanted to start it to be connected to our school. And so they, after I met with them, I reached out to my IT director because I had video recording studio equipment that hasn't gotten set up. And I said, hey, can we talk? We had a morning meeting virtually. I walked my computer into the recording studio, showed him around, and he said, what's your morning look like? I will be over at 9 a.m. with one of our communications people because they were starting a district podcast. And he came over and by the end of the day, like within a week, we had the roadcaster. And so they were really supportive. And so we taught the kids how to use it. And they recorded some stuff. We didn't publish it. They ran into some stuff as students do throughout the year. So I'm curious, will there, do you have a plan for how this will be shared out? Because I know that privacy, especially with our students, is an issue. But, but you also want to create that authentic audience for our students. So there, sh- there are ways that you can be able to, to share those on you know, on a, on a closed network or on, on something that, that students could then share with their families? So I think we're going to start by um, doing it through the library's Google Classroom, and we'll just have a section that's the podcast. Um, eventually, I want to branch it out beyond the club, and any kid who wants to pitch a show can pitch a show, and we'll just have a variety of shows. I'd love for my departments to have each a show. Um, I don't care. Like, my history department, we've got fantastic teachers in there. I can see some of them being like, this moment in history and let's do this. So 
Um, we'll start there. And then I want to work with our IT department to figure out safety stuff and go bigger, bigger. So people. Well, and I, I think that the best ex advice I was given when I wanted to do something like this was, you know, not wait for perfection. You know, you're going to do, you definitely have to be okay with the idea that the podcast is going to grow and it's going to morph and it's going to evolve and it's going to change. But you know, the idea that you have these students who are so excited to be here, I'm so excited for your students because you, you've you already overcome, like for me, it was the tech hurdle. It was the tech hurdle. For I, Tell your students, we got to focus on content because content is king and content will kill you. So that's where your students are going to need to sit down and really sort of hammer out some solid ideas. Absolutely. And I think they're willing to do it. Oh, I'm so excited for your, you. I'm so excited for your students. I'm so grateful that you, you took some time to stop off and, and talk. I hope you have a great conference. I hope you do too. Hi, I'm Heather Perkinson. I'm here from Maine and I represent um, Greeley High School, but also the Maine Association of School Libraries. I'm the current president. And um, it was a long trip to get here from Maine, but um, well worth it. And I already have way more books collected than I meant to get. I was going to limit myself to one tote bag, and I'm already up to two. Well, and friends, I, you and I recorded an episode, and I'm trying to remember the exact number, but it was about supporting rural libraries. That's right. That's right. And um, we're still struggling with a lot of book challenges in Maine and, um, you know, the book banners are finding new ways to circumvent our good policies and um, do things like put books on a shelf and require parental permission to access them. But uh, we're still fighting the good fight and um, we're still very proud of our rural libraries and all that they do to serve students, especially in the many towns in Maine where they don't have public libraries. So, you know, we talked a lot about the importance of, of the school libraries because you, are, you when you are living in Maine where you might be in areas where, where the next library isn't close by. So when you come to a conference like this, what kinds of things are you in particular looking for? I'm looking for anything I can use to help advocate for um, my libraries and my librarians. I went to a great session this morning which presented research about how important it is for there to be a librarian in the high school um, because they had data showing that there was a direct line between how comfortable new college students were using their libraries and going to their librarians for help. Um, and there was a direct correlation between that willingness and whether they'd had a high school librarian. So that kind of information is advocacy data I can use. Well, and as a relatively new high school librarian, I'm acutely aware that when I teach strategies to my students, the hope is that they are going to then employ those strategies moving forward and, and, and utilizing them when they, they you know, pursue a, you know, a degree beyond high school. I always tell my kids, now when you graduate and you go off to college, be sure to stop in at the college library and tell the librarian there that I sent you to say hello. I love that. Well, listen, I'm so glad you're here. Let, let me ask you, you drove? No. Okay. All right. I was a little concerned because friends, Maine head to Chicago. Yeah, this is a long way. No, we flew. I got it. All right. Listen, I'm so grateful you stopped by. Thank you so much, Heather. It's great to see you. Hi, I'm Caitlin Jernigan, and I'm an elementary school librarian in Nashville, Tennessee. And I am the current president of the Tennessee Association of School Librarians, or TESOL. Fantastic. And, you know, I, I love talking to people who have decided, you know what? I'm just going to commit everything to being a leader in my state. How have you found, like, your state organization, how do you prioritize the, the, the goals that you have made for this year that you're president? Well, one of the goals that we've had for several years is to get a state library coordinator for our state. That was not my doing. That was all the people before me. And so I'm so excited to help take this person and help them help tassel and help school librarians across our state. And so that's a testament to all the hard work from people before me. And so, um, but another goal that I have is to make our website and make our membership just more beneficial for our members, like adding more resources, adding more just like stuff for people to really 
be the best member that they could be, best librarian that they can be. Can I ask, because I know your state has a, a conference, what do you feel state organizations can do to better keep their members connected between, like, like between conferences, you know? So I'm really curious because that's something that, that I think there's so much momentum that, that leads memberships. I believe it in my, I, I live in, and, and work in Michigan. And, and when I work with my state organization, it usually builds up to that conference. So how do you feel states can do a better job of supporting their members, like when we're not going to conferences? Yeah. Well, especially in our state, um, some of our state is very rural. And so there's only one librarian per county or, you know, has several schools to, to go between. And so it's really important for our members to be able to connect with each other. And so that is what we do at conference. We all connect with each other, but we have um, webinars sometimes throughout the year. Um, we just, oh, we have a couple more dates during our summer PD. And so we've gone to several places all over the state to those, you know, little tiny towns where, you know, maybe you can't make it to our annual conference. Maybe you can make it to one of our smaller PD days during the summer. And so that's a great opportunity for um, some of those people in the far ends of our state. We have a really long state. And so try to get those people to, co you know, connect a little bit better. Um, and we have um, area reps that represent every single area of the state. We have 13 different areas. And so that's a great way to connect with others is to talk to people in your area and talk to people in, you know, just the next county over or, you know, two counties away and, and connect that way as well. I'm really curious to know, what are some of the summer offerings that you, you provided for your members? Because, you know, getting librarians to come get back and, and put that library brain on. And what are the kind of topics that you feel um, best support your members uh, during the summer? Well, the great thing is that all of our members submit topics. So these are all member, you know, led sessions. And so I know we had several sessions on book clubs. We had sessions on Canva, um, Karina Q right here, who just did the gamification session here at ALA, she talked at our virtual conference about chat GBT. So it, it's, you know, it's everything. We had, um, we're having somebody from our Tennessee Electronic Library speak about all the tell resources. I'm doing a session in one of our upcoming ones about just, you know, tips and tricks that I've picked up throughout the years to help elementary librarians. And so it, it's all kinds of things. Well, and we're lifelong learners. And, and the fact that you're doing such a great job supporting and members in your state, I, I know that that's absolutely inspirational and they're so lucky to have you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, it was great to see you. Hi, my name is Melissa Tom and I am a middle school teacher librarian in West Hartford, Connecticut. And I have been teaching in the library for eight years and I love my job. Fantastic. But you know, you, you've done this, this incredible thing. You've made this leap into, you know, it's not enough to be in the library. You've also become a podcaster. I have. And I just finished my first year. We did two seasons, one in the fall, one in the spring. It's called the Joyful Learning Podcast. And it started with my friend, Carrie Seiden. And a few years ago, we had this idea that we wanted to kind of share some of the things that have brought both of us joy and I said, well, let's like expand my blog. And she said, no, you like to talk. Let's create a podcast. I said, okay. And it took a year and we launched it in September and it's been a lot of fun. Well, and forgive me, but you have the, the choice of guests on your show. Uh, you're just so clever. So please go ahead and share because I know listeners are always looking for things to tune in, especially over the summer. And I love the idea that you focus on joy as, as, as driving the content that you put on your podcast. So please tell us what it goes into, how you choose your guests, and what do you hope to, to do when you, when you record with them? So it is a very organic, created podcast, and I have people that have had an impact on my life in one way or another. And in the first season, we had Barbara Johnson, who is a good friend and past president of the Castle Connecticut Association of School Librarians. Um, and she talks a lot about how she does her try this on Monday. She just curates amazing resources and she's very dynamic and always has like the answer to everybody's questions. And then we do authors because reading and books bring me so much joy. And my favorite, I think, one of my favorite episodes from season one is Natalie Lloyd, one of my favorite authors. Check her out. 
another favorite episode, and it's actually one of the first episodes I ever recorded in my makerspace in Connecticut was Lisa McMahon. And she is the most amazing author, has so many books. She and her husband came to Connecticut and sat in my makerspace, and we recorded using like actual podcast stuff from the Library of Things from Madison Public Library. I love that. So you borrowed your recording materials from your public library to invest in this podcast that you've put together with your, oh my God, I love that. So let me ask you, you're here at this conference, you were part of a, a fun road trip with your, with your friends. You know, what kinds of things are you hoping to take back when you go, uh, having come to this wonderful conference? Well, just obviously the first thing is so many books. We get to take home so many advanced copies of books that are coming out in the fall and the spring next year. And also just the stories and just leaving this Newberry Caldecott award banquet, listening to the award winners give their speeches and the backstory of how they got to be where they are and the influences that they had and bringing those to both my students and everybody just in my own life and sharing the love of books and reading and story, because that's what we need is, we need to know everybody's story and just to build this kind of community where we wanna make the world a more open, free, or like just a place where people are accepted and everybody can choose what they wanna read when they wanna read it. You know, I, I can't leave uh, this, this opportunity to, to share, a, and some of your, you've got so many layers. Um, you really, truly do. In addition to being a librarian, a podcaster, you're also a crafter. And um, I, I got to tell you, you've posted pictures of your craft room. And I was just, I, I was filled with a kind of, of envy that is unhealthy. But, you know, I, I want to, let me ask, are your literacy inspired products available for listeners to buy? If, uh, do you make them available on a website? Um, yes, I am right now actively on Etsy. However, I'm, I'm working on my Shopify. I am going to have an e-commerce Shopify. That is my summer goal. So I'm hoping by the fall it will be ready to go. I'm guessing for those of us who love to buy literacy-inspired gifts made by somebody who truly loves and has a passion for literacy, where could they reach out if they would like to purchase something you happen to have? Well, right now, if you email me at joyfullearning at melissatom.com, you can just tell me what you're interested in. I have a whole bunch of fabrics that range from pop culture to bookish, nerdy, anything that you are looking for, I probably have. So please reach out and let me know. And I'm working on a Shopify. So look for that coming in September. I will have, it's called Joyful Making is going to be my store name. Well, and friends, I'll make sure to put a link in the show notes. I am so grateful. Melissa Tom, you are a joy. You really, true. you embody that. Listen, I'm so grateful our paths cross and I look forward to all the exciting things that are coming for the fall for you. Oh, well, thank you. And I always love talking to you, Amy. It was so nice to see you. Have a great rest of the conference. Thank you, you too. Christy Sartain, thank you so much for coming. So I'm from Fayetteville, North Carolina, and I am currently the president-elect of NC Slamo, the North Carolina School Library Media Association. Um, before that, I was the uh, website director and the information director, and I've NC Slamo is my people. Like, I love my library life so much because it's being a library is who I am. I've wanted to be a librarian since second grade, and to be able to be living the dream is just... Oh my gosh, it, it's just everything to me. So uh, I am, I get in Fayetteville, North Carolina. I'm a high school librarian. I just finished my 10th year doing it. I've also worked two years as a public librarian and a whole bunch of other jobs before I was able to finish my MLS and get to do what I have loved to do forever. I am so curious because, you know, you have made the decision to uh, take time out of your summer and come to the conference. And, uh, you know, I'd love to know when you sort of set your sights on being here, what were some of the things you were hoping to get out of this experience? This is my first time ever at ALA. So I have no expectations. I had no idea what I was in for. I had no idea what I was doing. 
Um, luckily, Laura Aldridge, who is our AASL delegate, is here, and she's able to help guide me and give me tips and tricks. And that has been a godsend <laughs> because I really don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> um, so I have, again, no expectations. I'm just here to learn, to live the librarian life, and to meet people. And Amy, I'm so glad that I finally got to meet you in person because we've been emailing. Um, Amy's going to be our keynote speaker at our conference in October. Yay! And so for me to be able to meet her is just amazing. And I told her earlier, people are coming to conference just to hear her talk. So yay, thank you for that. Um, and yeah, so I, I'm just here to see what happens and what there is. Well, and I'll say right now, um, I, this is my first ALA. I was supposed to come uh, during the pandemic and that of course was was uh, canceled altogether. But, you know, I think making those human connections because right now it's about building that community. And when we get those rare opportunities to build it in person, that is so meaningful. So let me ask you, uh, above and beyond like making those personal connections, you, you know, let me ask, were you able to, to bring or, or rally some of your other uh, librarians to come to this conference? And, you know, you know, how do you see this experience sort of playing out in, in say, the next school year? So I don't know how it's going to play out in the next school year because this is because it's ALA and it's all libraries. There aren't a ton of sessions just for school librarians. So I'm very picky and choosy about what I'm going to um, attend. So ironically, this is the first time I've been in this building this morning. And my very first session was the gamification. And I'm sitting there and I look over and I'm like, I think that's the back of Amy Herman's head and sitting in front of me. Uh, <laughs> It was. <laughs> so my very first session, I get to meet Amy Herman and I get to get a, a, a school librarian experience. And it's just been a lot of fun um, for that. We do have several NC Slama people here. So I'm really excited about that. And I've seen people here and there that I know. And uh, really, I'm looking for all the Twitter people that I follow because several months ago, I was like, you know what, I'm gonna start using Twitter like like I'm supposed to as a PLN and started following a ton of people and all kinds of other people started following me. And um, so I was in the session and I tweeted them during the session and I was like, oh my gosh, I already follow them and they follow me back already. Like, how long has that been going on? That's so cool. So it's nice to see the people in person that I follow on Twitter and that I respect and admire and get so much information from. So I'm really excited about that. Caitlin, I'm following you next. She's, she's in line. <laughs> <laughs> but it's putting a uh, face to a name and putting a person to, and, and all of a sudden this connection will carry us because we've connected and we have like, all of a sudden we're like, oh yeah, we, we were at LA together. And, and that is enough because the next time I see you, we'll be in person again and this will be fantastic. Hey, I hope you have a great conference. Thank you so much for joining us today, Christy. Thank you so much, Amy. I am just thrilled to have gotten to see you. <laughs> I'm Jennifer. I'm an elementary school librarian in the West Village in New York City. And this is, I think, my fourth or fifth ALA conference. I'm actually a native Chicagoan, so I'm actually home. So I am, it's still, it kind of is weird. It feels like I'm a tourist in my own city, um, but it's really great to be home. Um, I actually had a few items on my agenda for this ALA, particularly book bans and this copyright session that we just attended. Um, I am very lucky. I Working in the West Village in New York City, I'm in an urban bubble. Um, you know, I'm in a very progressive school. Um, I have not experienced any challenges to books, um, but I'm ready in case. Like, I have a a policy in place, like, you know, talk with my administrators about it if it were to happen. But I do want to be able to support my colleagues in other schools if it were to happen in other other cities and other states. So I just want to, you know, always be able to help advocate and help offer support um, and fight the fight when necessary. Because I think what's happening around the country is is absolutely ridiculous and terrifying. Um, and our kids deserve a lot better than, than what's happening right now. Um, and the copyright, we just, uh, Amy and I just attended a copyright session together about fair use and copyright and how to apply that in our school library settings and um, really in how to um, teach our teachers how to use copyright and fair use responsibly 
and how to model it for our students. And I think that's the most important part because it's not, no, there are no copyright police, most likely, that are going to come and find us, you know, maybe unless we're in a big district and someone gets wind that we're doing something and, you know, legal action gets taken. But, you know, I, it, I think it's really important for us as teachers and librarians to model best practices, responsible practices for our students so that they know what to do and they know that they can't just go out into this big wild world of the internet and use whatever's out there freely, um, you know, without abandon and know that there are restrictions and guidelines and that, you know, I think one of the most important things with fair use is that it does not mean unlimited use. And that was one of the things that was highlighted in the workshop. And, um, you know, it was it was nice to hear some of the things that I'm already teaching my students reiterated, but also hear some new strategies and some new, you know, little lessons. We heard that we participated in this great activity, you know, this drawing activity where, you know, we got to draw something with a partner and then talk about if it was fair use after we made some changes to it. Um, so some cool things to take back to my school and and present to my teachers and, you know, prepare for some difficult conversations because I don't think that a lot of my my faculty really understands the importance of fair use and copyright because I think there's a misconception that if it's for education, it's okay to just use anything and that, you know, it's it's okay. And that, you know, we can make copies of things or show things on Netflix or Amazon and and that it's okay and that there aren't any regulations or, you know, restrictions or well, Jennifer, you're hitting on something that really worries me because I, I've worked so hard to to be that that supporter of the things that are happening in the classroom, and and I can better support my teachers when I understand what's going on in their classroom. But I I'm almost sort of like walking in and going, oh my gosh! And everywhere I turn, it's like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, at some point when you and I see it especially because we've got a, a copy center in my learning commons, and so all of a sudden I'm like you know, what are you photocopying that it is taking two hours? And they're like, oh, it's just a chapter. And I'm like, la, 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 la. I'm not, you know, on the one hand, I, I don't want to, to, to be that copyright police. On the other hand, you know, districts do get caught and they do get sued. And, and there, there are repercussions for abusing this uh, with the misunderstanding that, that it's okay, it's for educational purposes and we're a public school and how can you possibly come after us? And but I, I'm hoping to have an episode coming up. I've, I've talked to the, the people who did the presentation today, and they've all seemed really on board. But, you know, we aren't lawyers. Most most teachers and librarians who, who go to work every day also don't have a, a law degree and, and be able to say, uh, yeah, sure, we're totally safe doing this. So let me ask, you know, you, you're, a, you're a librarian in the summertime. The, the summer is still, you've got a lot of the summer ahead of you. I, I know that when you're in New York, you guys just got out of school, just. And this is only my, I, this is the start of my second week of, of summer vacation. We, we got out a week before, and I, but I know you just got out of school. So you're still almost a, like school brain and everything. Uh, I, what, what are you going to do to create some, some balance? Because, you know, right now you've just spent all this time investing in, in yourself and your profession, but I hope you've got some fun plans planned for the, for the rest of the summer. Um, well, actually, I'm I'm actually planning on going into my library to do some work on the physical space, but it's actually I want to, and I like doing that kind of work. I want to do some organizing of the of my middle grade fiction and do some genreifying. So I find that very gratifying. But on the fun side of things. Um, my favorite baseball team is coming to New York to play the Mets. So the Chicago White Sox play the Mets in mid-July. So I'm going to two of those games and I'm actually planning on starting a podcast. So I'm very much looking forward to doing that. I am a really big baseball fan and it's been a passion of mine for since childhood. So I am hoping to start a baseball podcast this summer about the human side of baseball and talk about fan and player interaction. And I'm really excited about that. Um, no real travel plans this summer, um, but just really spending some time at home with my cats, doing some reading and spending time with friends. 
But listen, you and I are going to have to have a conversation because at some point you and I can like get on the phone and talk about this podcast plan that you've got of yours because I, I have a few things I can share with you that I have picked up along the way. But Jennifer, I hope you have a safe drive home and, and thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Amy. I look forward to getting to know you more. <laughs> So I'm Bonnie McBride. I'm the teacher librarian at Fenway High School, which is in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, I'm here to learn more about best library practices and bring stuff back to our growing librarians in our district of Boston. I'm so excited. You were telling me of how many people you have brought in to work in your district. And I, I see that as an absolute like it's so validating to hear that your district has placed a premium on having certified school librarians in their libraries. Yes. So um, three years ago, we were at 22 certified school librarians for 136 schools in Boston, which is ridiculous. Um, and through many years of advocacy, we got finally got a supportive superintendent, Dr. Brenda Caselius, who's unfortunately left us. But she put the wheels in motion to um, eventually every school have a certified school librarian. So we added 30 last school year. We're adding 30 more this coming school year and then another 30 the year after. Um, and then we will have one for every school in Boston, which is extremely exciting. This is a huge win. Oh, my gosh. So that's going to be transformative. And, you know, this is something that's going to benefit every single student, every single teacher. I, I just I wish I had a better sense of just how this was accomplished. Can you give us an idea? So it started grassroots with um, a group of us were organizing within the union and then also what helped was our current, our library director at the time, who's since retired, um, Debbie Froggett, she was advocating at the central office level. So it was kind of a two-pronged approach where a group of us were advocating through the union. She was advocating at central office. We would speak at school committee meetings. We just started getting the word out there of what librarians can do and how essential we are. And that's when the superintendent was like, oh, yes, we need one of those. And again, it was really pushing the inequities, how some schools had it and had students prepared for college, and other schools didn't. So there were vast inequities in our district, that, and that is something we're trying to resolve. I think that's a fantastic strategy, and I know that listeners right now are like, oh, right, <laughs> that's amazing. I, it seems obvious, but, you know, I, I got to be honest, I work in a district that doesn't have a school librarian in every building, and, you know, un understand that the, the culture sometimes has to change, and it, it, it takes a lot to, to really sort of move that needle so let me ask you, when you go home, what are some things that you're really excited to do? I know you're on, on summer break, but, but I'm sure, like all librarians, you're thinking about the things that you're excited to do and implement in your program. So um, one thing I really want to get going more of when we come back in the fall is more passive programming. I've seen so many cool ideas on Twitter. I have many people I follow have been collecting through the year. And that's one thing I really want to do when I get back is have something, not just books, because I love books and I've taught books all the time to all the children. But not every student who steps into the library is excited about books. And hopefully I get them there by the end of the, the time when they graduate from high school. But I want something fun that they can come in. What's happening in the library today? And feel like they are belong and are included. Well, and you can be sure there is a, an episode on passive programming. We will link in the show notes. You know, Bonnie, I'm so grateful you took time out of your busy day to stop and chat with us. I also appreciate that you might share the podcast with some of these rookie hires that you just brought in. Yes, most definitely. Um, we have a lot of people who are brand new to the library profession. They might be teachers moving over into becoming librarians. We have library powers who are getting certified to be full librarians. And so your podcast is full of such a wealth of information that I'm excited to share it with them and they can learn on their own speed, especially over the summer. Well, and I, I do want to just sort of impart one, one sort of suggestion, and that is to use the podcast for professional development in your, in your district. It sounds like they are open to new ideas and to change and to building a program that right now is, is really just gaining momentum. So talking to your administrators, talking to your central office and saying, listen, we'd like to use the podcast to be part of the PD that we can customize for each of the buildings and their particular needs. I love that idea. Thank you for that. <laughs> Have a fantastic conference and thank you so much for stopping by. Thank you, Amy. Uh, my name is Scott Summers. I live in Apex, North Carolina, and I am a librarian at the College of Education at NC State University. So clarify, because this is uh, so many people I talk to are 
you know, they work in, in uh, high school, middle school, elementary school, but you, your job is very different. Yeah. So in the College of Education, we have a space called Media and Education Technology Resource Center, aka Metric, and it models a K-12 library for students who are pre-service teachers who are going to be teachers. Um, and we have this amazing space uh, where we have books, technology, and we work with them to say like, hey, this is what it's going to be like to work with a school librarian, work with a tech facilitator when you get to your job. So I'm so excited. So on the regular, you talk to pre-service teachers about the value of what school librarians can bring. And you do this for like basically a K-12 setting. Uh, that's correct. So these teachers, um, they have different content areas. And we say, hey, no matter what you're doing in your class, they are support in your building in a school librarian, in a tech facilitator, right? These standards that you have, they're also um, librarian standards and technology standards. And we do crosswalks with those and say, hey, you don't have to do all this work by yourself. There's amazing support people in your school, a school librarian, a tech facilitator who are just ready and willing to work with you to make the magic happen for your students. So I'm really curious, do you feel that like at NC State, do they, um, do they make it a priority that their pre-service teachers at all include a lesson or activity when they do their, you know, you know practicum in, in the workplace? Um. 100%. So very early on, they have um, experiences, so field experiences. And then once they're doing their student teaching, right, they're taking over that classroom full time. Um, but a lot of the students either are doing it by themselves or doing it just in their content area and not bringing in those additional resources like the school librarian. Uh, so we really work to say, like, here are the books that are available. Here are the resources available that you can use from our space, but also like advocate to get them in your space, in your career, in your job, right? We have these amazing resources. And if your school doesn't have them when you start your career, we're giving you the tools to say, hey, we really need this to accomplish these goals with our kids. Well, that was sort of my next question, because there is a great deal of assumption on the part of North Carolina State University that all schools have certified school librarians in them. Yeah, so um, some districts have them and some districts don't, right? You can look at the statistics, right? Every year, the number seems to be dropping. Um, so yeah, being an advocate saying like, Hey, where's a school librarian in the school? Like we really need them, right? We're trying to say like, this is the value of a school librarian, right? We can really collaborate with you. Um, we have standards too. We're really trying to get students to read again, to be excited about learning, to use technology. Um, and I think if they get to a school that doesn't have one, they're really going to miss that and be like, Hey, where's the school librarian? We really need them. Like I had this amazing person telling me how great school librarians are. Like we need to hire one ASAP. Well, and I know I have my ELA team to thank for for hiring me because my position was also somebody with a ed tech certificate could have filled my position, but it was through the, you know, advocacy of, of our ELA team that said, no, 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 we actually need a, a school librarian. Uh, yeah, so we, I mean, when I went to library school, we get some training in technology, right? So I think if you are at a school that has both a tech facilitator and a school librarian, I mean, you, a teacher, a school librarian, and a tech facilitator, that's like your dream team. Um, I think school librarians get pulled a lot to do technology stuff, but that's not really like their level of expertise. Um, they can do a lot of that stuff, but I think they want to focus on literacy, focus on materials, focus on books, focus on like getting the right book in the hands of the student who really needs it. Um, and that technology stuff, not as secondary, but still part of it. I'm telling you, as somebody who resets passwords on a daily basis, who checks out charging cords to students and repairs, uh, you know, Chromebooks, I, I, I'm telling you, I, I shake my head and I'm so frustrated because there are so many other things I realize I need to be doing. I hate when librarians get pulled for that stuff. When I was a school librarian and I was resetting passwords, it drove me crazy because it takes away from the time of doing the important work and the more impactful work that school librarians do. Um, so I definitely agree with you over there. I really think it's exciting because you're working with aspiring teachers and preaching the good word of collaborating with that school librarian because so often that conversation doesn't happen. And I'm thinking about other states and other programs. I, I think they really should learn something from North Carolina State University. Uh, yeah, so I think a lot of teachers, these uh, pre-service teachers, before I met them, they said like, oh, I'm going to be alone or I'm only going to be in my grade level team or just my content area team. But I'm like, no, there is this amazing person who really knows what it's like who really like can plan with you and like help you do what you need to do. Um, so yeah, I, every day I get to have the best job and say like, hey, pre-service teachers, there is someone ready and willing to work with you as a school librarian. They're amazing. They have the training. They are going to support you in those really critical first five years. You know, like most teachers leave five years uh, in the classroom. 
So um, we're trying to keep them there, keep them excited, get them to use books and technology. Um, it really is a really great job. I am so excited for the the kids and the, the, the schools of North Carolina because they have this, this effort that's being taken on by North Carolina State University. And thank you so much for stopping by, Scott. I hope you have a great rest of the conference. Yes, thank you so much. You too. Hi, my name is Courtney Pentland, and I'm a high school librarian in Nebraska. And when you're not busy working in your school library, you have found your way into a great deal of many leadership positions. Can you give us an idea of your journey as a leader in the field of school librarianship? Oh, um, I really, truly, strongly believe that um, we as professionals need to be involved in our professional associations. It's one of the ways that we not only get to serve and give back to our profession, but we get to meet so many people from so many different places that work in communities that are the same as ours or different from ours. And we get to really come together and learn from each other. And we are stronger together, as Amy always says. Um, and that's one of the ways that I have been able to grow not just my professional learning network, but my friend group, some of my very close friends I met through leadership positions. So I think it's really important to step up in those leadership positions. I started out in my school, and then that turned into my state association, where I served as a board member at large, and then as a president cycle and several committee chairs. And now I am working on the AASL board of directors as the incoming ASL president as of July 1st, 2023. And one of the things that I, again, truly firmly believe is that if you have questions about the process or you're concerned about things that are happening in an association or you're wondering why things are done the way that they are, the best way to learn about that is to join and volunteer and have your voice heard. I can't wait to uh, I see you in uh, Tampa in uh, AASL's uh, 2023 uh, annual meeting and, and, and conference and, and be able to call you Madam President. That's very exciting. But what brings you here to ALA? Because I know that you are incredibly busy and uh, I want to make sure that listeners know what are the kinds of things that motivate people to stop everything they're doing in the summer and make their way over to an ALA national conference. So I am here to work. Um, as a board of directors member, we have lots of meetings, so I don't get to go to as many sessions that, you know, general members get to go to. Um, and there are a ton. There are so many great ones um, people are doing that I wish I could see. But we have a lot of membership meetings, and this is an opportunity for us to connect with people from across the country in real life and not just through virtual meetings and get to hear what's happening um, and what people are excited about, what things that they're worried about, the things that they want to celebrate. So it's that connection, that personal conversations that you get to have in the hallway or on the shuttle bus from the hotel that really make a big difference. Um, Melissa Tom, who I believe has been on the podcast, uh, we met on a shuttle bus years ago for an SLJ event, and we are now conference buddies. So we just hang out um, at conferences and, and get to know each other that way. So it's the only place, and ASL in Tampa is the only conference that is of that size and of that nature that is for school librarians. So every single session, every single moment, every vendor is tailored for us. Well, and I tell people going to AASL uh, conferences, and, and, and I'll be honest, I've only been to one, and that was in Salt Lake. And friends, it's kind of like speed dating because every single person in the room all wants to meet every single person in the room. And so it is, I, I can't tell you, the, the energy in that space is just palpable. And um, future Madam President, I'm so excited, friends. You, I'll make sure to include the links. You know, Courtney's been on the show twice. She's, she's done uh, Can I Just Vent? Uh, and that was really an entertaining. And, but you also do one that has become incredibly popular and has withstood the test of, of uh, we are now in a sort of a, a post-pandemic place. But, but the episode you recorded on virtual job interviews 
is and remains incredibly popular because that has sort of become the standard by which so many of us start our job, uh, you know, exploration. So, you know, thank you so much for making sure that when you had those experiences, you were able to pass that, that learned experience around to listeners because that's what this is all about. It was such a bizarre thing at that moment um, because I'd never done one before. And it was in, I want to say, April of 2020. So that made it, you know, fairly unique, I guess, in the moment. Um, and I learned a lot from that process. My husband went through a virtual job interview at the same time. And we're both still employed in our new positions. So that's wonderful. Um, but it is something that is different than speaking to people face to face. So I'm so glad that it's still being used and still helpful. I hope you have a great rest of the conference and I can't wait to see you at Tampa. Thanks, Amy. Uh, hi, my name is Jenny Lucier. I am a pre-K through two librarian in Durham, Connecticut, which is a pretty rural, but in the middle of some pretty big cities in Connecticut. And I work in a pretty small school. We only have 250-ish kids. Uh, but that's, I spend my, my days hanging out with some of the best kids and best grown-ups that I can think of. You know, I'm, I'm so curious because we all got here one way or another. Uh, and a lot of people cheated and just like got on a plane and magically appeared in Chicago. But you and your, your gal pals seem to make something of a celebration in the, the getting of, of here to the conference. Would you recommend this? And please share with us, how did you happen to come by ALA this year in Chicago? So, uh, yeah, so, so four of us from Connecticut, uh, we got in a car and we drove like 13 hours and I uh, wouldn't have traded it for the world. I work with the best librarians, I think, in the whole world, our Connecticut uh, Library Association group. And um, I'm currently president of this association. And so we are here in Chicago to celebrate and, and meet amazing people and uh, just work with the National Library Association group. And yeah, I would ad absolutely say a road trip would be worth it. Stop in Cleveland, have some great food. Um, but we alternated between having some great uh, fun with 90s music and, you know, planning for what was going to happen with our Library Association in the next year. Well, and it was something of a working drive because you were sort of you know, between songs, coming up with ideas and plans for what you guys are going to do in the coming year. So we talked about doing different PD things. We talked about the fact that we need advocacy to be kind of on the forefront because of all of the, the challenges that have been going on across the country this year. And so really just kind of thinking, who, who can we contact? Who can we make connections with? And I think, you know, you asked kind of what what was our purpose in coming to ALA and, you know, getting a million books is wonderful, but it's really all about making connections with the people that are here. You know, there aren't many people brave enough like you to teach three and four year olds, but you have done this for a while. What would you say is the best time frame for working with three and four year olds in your library space? Because I think a lot of administrators probably have a flawed sense of what a three-year-old or a four-year-old can handle when it comes to going to a library for a visit. So mm, I'm really lucky. I have a 30-minute visit. And every once in a while, that feels a little long, but it really is the best. And we sing, and we do finger plays, and we read stories, and both, both fiction and nonfiction, we spend a lot of time uh, building and you know, stacking cups and playing with Legos and coloring and just doing all of the things that make them really want to come to the library. And of course, choosing a book to take home with them every single week. Well, and building that culture of reading can't start soon enough, especially if they're not getting those regular trips to the public library. I love that you are able to work with our absolute youngest of patrons and teaching them how to love the library. And, you know, we even do things with, you know, they hold a stuffed animal as we're reading. And so they get to pick their favorite, like, book stuffed animal. And even if, you know, even if that day they can only handle reading a few pages of a book, we're still doing all of those things. And we're listening for rhymes and we're adding all of those, you know, basics for reading. And we just want to make it fun and something they really, really enjoy. 
You know, Jenny, I'm so excited for the school librarians of Connecticut. They're awfully lucky to have somebody so passionate and who feels strongly about this. And I'm so grateful that our paths crossed. Thank you and have a great rest of the conference. Thank you so much. It was great to talk to you. Hi, I'm Carrie Betts, and I am a school librarian from the state of Michigan. And I um, lead West Maple's school library, which was the national school library of the year for this year. And, you know, I'm just going to just put you on the spot right now. Please tell me you're going to join us for a conversation on that process and, and celebrate the program that you have. Absolutely. So we'll be, we'll be hearing more from Carrie Betts in season six, friends. And I'm going to tell you, I, my, uh, you know, connection to Carrie has gone way back. It, it, not only are we both part of the same state organization, but I'll tell you what, when I was really trying to get better at my craft, my district gave me a day to go and shadow somebody. And I'll tell you, Carrie just opened her library and her heart and just shared all of her resources. She is the reason why I knew about our state grant our travel grant that we can apply for. I mean, I, school librarians are so resourceful. And when we connect with them, especially the leaders in our state, we always do better. Carrie, tell me, this is your second conference. Why do you make coming to ALA a priority? Um, I think it's a great opportunity for us to get out of our one little tiny bubble that is all like school library, school library. And I think that we do ourselves a, um, a, a di we're, we put ourselves at a disadvantage when we don't um, put ourselves out there in the public library space to kind of understand um, how we can maybe collaborate better with our public libraries in our school districts. And then also um, they're doing some really great things that we can adapt for our school library spaces. And so I think it's really valuable. Well, and Carrie, I followed you on social media, and I remember last year when you were in D.C. at ALA, um, you were just, uh, you, you were carrying bags upon bags upon bags of all these amazing books. Could you give school librarians an idea of what were some of your physical takeaways from going to a conference like this? Um, so the physical takeaway, of course, was all the books, naturally. Um, but even um, last year, one of the biggest takeaways I had, I had attended um, one of the sessions was on uh, how school or how public libraries are making sensory spaces for autism uh, spectrum, uh, everybody in the community who is neurodiverse. There you go. Um, and uh, I came away from that and immediately I crochet. <laughs> and they were like, oh, during our story times, we have like these fidget pillows. And so then I started making them. And so I came back to the school year right out of the gate. I had six fidget pillows. I gave three of them to our autism classroom. And then I had a couple that I kept in the library for my students who need um, something to do with their hands. Oh, my gosh. And, you know, this is fantastic. Would you mind at some point sharing with me a, a picture of this? Because somebody's going to be like, I need to see what this looks like. And maybe a link in our, or we'll put a link in our show notes. Absolutely. And I will tell you, the materials that I used, I bought a container of a package of bean bags so that it was weighted. And then I just did granny squares over the top with some buttons. It was great. So, yes, a picture easy. Oh, I hope you have a fantastic rest of the conference. You're going to drive back to, to our, our favorite state, Michigan, and, and have a great rest of the summer. Thanks. You too, Amy. Uh, so my name is Gene Ambaum. Uh, I used to write a comic called Unshelved, and now I write a comic called Library Comic. These comics are about libraries. Uh, and I just come here to ALA to meet fans and to sell t-shirts and just to kind of shake hands. So here I am at my booth. And behind us is the graphic novel stage, which you can probably hear at this point. Yes. And Gene, I'll tell you, that I've never met you before, but I'm a huge fan of the patches, the library inspired patches that you create and I wear to all my events. Would you tell us a little bit about what inspired the patches and, uh, you know, how you have made it possible for us to broadcast on our person the, uh, what, what is so important to us? You, you are probably the best advertiser I never knew about. So thank you so much for that. Um, so I don't know, a couple years ago, I was casting around for my ideas and I have, I have a notebook. So I have no idea when this idea started, probably 10 years ago. Um, but just before COVID, probably 2018, 2019, we had the idea for the patches and my, my current artist for library comic, her name is Willow Payne and she's fantastic. And I said, hey, maybe you could do like a back patch, like a motorcycle kind of thing. And I came up with, uh, instead of 
MC, like every motorcycle club has a little tiny patch that says MC. Mine says BC for book club. And instead of the Second Amendment patch to promote gun ownership, I, we do the First Amendment patch to promote freedom of expression and freedom of thought, and so freedom of reading. Um, so it all kind of came together with Willow's help, and she designed this wonderful set of patches for us. We put them out there. They got a lot of love. And then during COVID, um, a guy in Massachusetts wore them to a library opening, and it went bananas. And that actually floated me through all of the worst of the pandemic business-wise. So thanks to him. So, yeah. And, and, and now everybody seems to be wearing them, including you, which is fantastic, and telling people about it. I'll tell you what, um, I, I'll be very selfish. I wear this jacket at work sometimes when my principal has assigned me to do things that are completely unrelated to the, to the uh, being working in the library when I'm sent to go work and, and repair the Chromebooks and I'm sent outside the library to go do things that have nothing to do with being a librarian. So you are, in effect, my sort of aggression that I can wear. Uh, and, and, and really, and then I, I, I pair it with my union t-shirt. Very nice. Very nice. Very nice. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I mean, I think you work at a school library, right? I certainly do. Is this a, is this a G-rated podcast or is it okay? We do have to keep it clean. Okay. Th then uh, I won't tell you what my new anti-censorship patch says, but um, I think people in your position, I've been encouraging them to put them on the inside where they can flash them at each other. Um, it does have the F word in it. Yes. Uh, it's, it's about censorship. So I, I love the fact that you're wearing this aggressively. This is this is how it was intended, so. Well, and, and for listeners, I, I'm going to include the link to your website in the show notes, but give us a sense of what other kinds of very promotional, like, uh, library-friendly messages and things that you have put, uh, you, uh, you, I noticed T-shirts, so if you, you don't want to wear patches on a shirt, but tell us, what other things can listeners find at your website? Um, well, so my current new thing, my newest T-shirt is a Books Win T-shirt, and we, it was, it's actually based on a card in this Reader's Advisory card deck that we made a few years ago. Um, and and it's, it's a bunch of books. It's a crowd of books, like, kind of cheering with a big banner that says Books Win. I was trying to, I went anti-censorship with my potty mouth uh, in one way, and I thought, I need something everybody can wear at, like, different libraries, school libraries, public libraries. So we have the Books, books Win t-shirt. Um, Fiends of the Library has been interesting. Like, a lot, of, a lot of people have friends group, but people are like, no, we actually have a Fiends group, but we don't want to let them know, so... So that's been part of the message. And in, in October on librarycomic.com, we actually, instead of the regular comics about a library, we have a monster library where monsters work in the library. So, and if you go to fiendsofthelibrary.com, you can see all the strips we've done in the past, uh, past few years for that. Um, I don't know, like, like I just, I think they're pro-reading, they're anti-censorship, uh, they're everything I, I kind of love in the world. And it's fun to be able to think up t-shirts and then actually walk around and see people wearing them. The weirdest thing is people go, where did you make that t-shirt? And I'm like, I made that. And they're like, no, 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 where did you buy it? I'm like, no, I made it, but I do sell them. Here's where, here's where that is. Or when I see them in the wild, just somebody walking around with them, that's the most fun, so. Well, and friends, be sure to check out this website. I'll tell you, I wear this jacket all the time and get great compliments, but it also gives me a sense of empowerment. Pair it with those Doc Martens and you feel like you're going into battle and it's my shield. So, Gene, thank you so much for centering librarians and all the work that we do and making it possible for us to make sure that that message is broadcast loud and proud. I'm, I'm a librarian, too. I've never been a school librarian, but I've always wanted to do that. So I admire the work you guys do. And I think you walk a real fine line between administration and parents and intellectual freedom. So, you know, good luck out there. Thanks so much, Gene. Yeah, take care. Well, hi there again. Uh, this is Sarah Smith. I am a, now the district librarian for Sanger Unified in uh, California. So it's like the middle of the state. And yeah, here at uh, ALA 2023. That's Pretty awesome. Having a good time. Well, and, and Sarah, you know, we've crossed paths many times. And so we, we don't oftentimes, you know, see each other during the year, but we always try and connect at conferences. And friends, if you recognize her voice, it's because she has been uh, notably on episode 100 and on episode 200. And her specialty is graphic novels and manga. And I, I can't say enough nice things about your web resource, which you have made freely available to everybody. Would you please tell us what you do in your spare time to support school librarians everywhere? I read as much manga as I possibly can get my hands on. And then I write reviews. Um, so I'm writing right now for Booklist and School Library Journal. I do mostly manga reviews for them. And then everything that doesn't fit because they have space limitations, uh, I put on my website, which is graphiclibrary.org. Um, so uh, I have my, my input has definitely gone down on the website. I used to be like 30 a month and now I'm down to maybe like 15. So sorry, guys, you only get 15 free ones for me a month. 
But I'm going to tell you right now, I had a grant and I earmarked quite a bit for building my graphic novel slash uh, manga in my collection. And the first thing I did was actually just message you because you're part of my virtual PLN. And I said, oh my goodness, I have to spend this money. And of course, we usually get that, that small window that we have to do all of our, our due diligence. But your reviews are fantastic. And what really sells it for me is that you tag, you take the time to tag everything and you really look at this content through the eyes of a school librarian. Yeah, so it's been, uh, it's really, really important to me as a person that's trying to get stuff. Like we're in a small rural town that's fairly conservative. So I am trying to find stuff that, you know, I can make sure that is good for my shelves and good for my students. And then, you know, I've been doing a lot of work trying to champion manga, especially for school libraries. And part of that is getting over that stigma that manga is inappropriate and there's nothing good for kids. So, you know, I try to be meticulous about what is in every volume and I do volume by volume reviews. I don't have a lot of combined volume ones so that you get nuance about what is in every book. So you know what's going on your shelf. You know, you are so important to me when I need an expert on manga and graphic novels. I am so grateful that you're here. Can you just say again, you, you, what did you come to ALA for? Because I, I, friends, I gotta tell you, Sarah brought her dad and we got to hang out just a little bit before the conference started. And I love that you are using this opportunity for professional development, but also creating those memories with your father. But, you know, tell me what really motivated you to come here? Um, so FOMO, first and foremost, I knew that when people started tweeting, I was going to be really sad that I didn't come. Um, but ALA has become, and some of the other national conferences has been like, obviously a way to connect with people that you only know on Twitter. Um, but this one, like, so the, the growth in comics and manga from last year to this year means that ALA has kind of become a little Comic-Con for me. And there's creators here that I would have to pay money to see at San Diego Comic-Con. And they're free and they're 10 feet away from me. And I, I hugged Jeff Lemire yesterday. Like, I hugged him. And I fangirled all over him. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I come to immerse myself more and uh, make connections a lot with publishers. Like, being here last year and introducing myself and telling all the publishers what I do, I get a lot of review copies now. So, um, because like, you know, I'm eventually I'm helping them with sales, right? Like, and I'll still buy it from my library if it's, if it makes the cut. So it's not like they're just giving me a book for free and then I put it on my shelf and I call it a day. You know, I'm helping them get stuff into school libraries. So I'm t like this year kind of reconnecting with some of those publishers that I met last year and cementing some of those. Um, I met the editor of book list and I told him we needed more space. <laughs> so, um, I've been like less so professional development and more just like being a little bit more um, greedy with my time. Like, it's for me. I'm here for me. I'm here out of my own pocket. I'm here to promote what I'm doing and try and help people and get more manga to students. Um, but then have a good time. Like, this is vacation. So we did some sightseeing and everything, too. So, <laughs> Sarah Smith, you are a gem. I, friends, I'm going to put the links in the show notes to Sarah's episode. I am so grateful every time I see that we're in the same space. I know we're going to connect. Oh, definitely. It's always fun. Like you walk in the room, I'm like, ah, it's Amy. <laughs> Have a great conference. You too. Hi, my name is Celine Holmes, and I'm the preschool lower school librarian at Academy of the Sacred Heart in New Orleans, Louisiana. Fantastic. I'm so, I just sat in your session and I was absolutely like, okay, I got to come over here and talk to you. So I really am excited. So would you share with listeners what your session was about? Because I think it is so relevant to school librarians. Well, thank you so much. And I was part of a session that was teaching with primary sources. And ALA just developed a LibGuide that is for all kinds of libraries. So it's for school librarians, academic librarians, public librarians, anybody. Um, and it's how to use primary sources in your library for programming, for classes, um, and so each section of the guide has primary sources from the Library of Congress, and it gives examples, and then how you can use those. It has programming ideas, um, it has display ideas and recommendations, and other ways that you can find primary sources so you can adapt those programs to your library. You know, I, I, I know I'm not alone, but I, I think there are a lot of folks whose um, sort of misconceptions about the Library of Congress, we, we really don't realize the potential that this resource has to support all the learners that we have in in elementary middle school and high school but you know I'd love for you to give me just sort of a little taste what's something that you've used 
from the, the Library of Congress with your students. Sure. And I mean, it can be kind of overwhelming, right? Because the Library of Congress has over 170 million resources. So, um, and I think a lot of people have this idea about primary sources being these documents that you have to be able to read um, or, you know, decipher antiquated handwriting to really understand and use. But um, primary sources are their artifacts, their photos, um, their audio recordings, uh, video recordings. And so these are things that students as young as pre-K can use, and it helps to build their visual literacy, and it helps to bring history to life for them. So um, a lot of times I will start a story time or one of my classes off with a primary source photograph, and we just go through an analysis of it. I don't use that word analysis with pre-K, but, um, you know, I'm just asking them, what do you see? And then based on what they see, so they're saying things like, I see a tree or I see railroad tracks. And then they put all that together and I say, okay, so here's what everybody said they saw in this photograph. Now, what do you think is happening in the photograph? And sometimes I'll give um, all of the students magnifying glasses and they have a printout of the photo and they become the history detectives. So they're looking for clues to see like, and they have to circle it on their picture. And then they have to try to figure out what happened in the mystery and can they solve it? I'm hoping that you will come and help us because I know all of us, we, we see the potential that a resource like this can be not only for our students, but also to give our staff some of the most fantastic uh, images and, and records and, and primary sources that, that they need to support the learning that's happening in their classroom. Will you join us in season six for, for an episode, please? I would absolutely love to. I share primary sources with um, all of my teachers. My principal actually um, makes a joke now. Every time I say primary sources, we should all take a shot. So, you know, like <laughs> um, it's just become a drinking game now. But um, <laughs> um, but it's uh, there are so many there are primary sources for every topic. There's a primary source for everything. And I would love to share that with everybody. I'm so grateful that we crossed paths. This is really fantastic. I hope you have a great rest of the conference. All right. Thank you. You too. Enjoy ALA. Hi, my name is Robbie Barber. I am a Tucker High School teacher librarian, which is in the city of Tucker, which is Metro Atlanta. Um, and I have a high school of about 1,600 students. And this past year, I had no aid. So it was a very stressful year, to say the least. And, you know, friends, the fun thing about meeting Robbie again is that you and I, our friendship dates back four years. I was going to ISTE 19 in Philadelphia, and I met you at the uh, uh, school librarian's playground and asked if you would be on my podcast. And you were one of the handful of people that day who said yes. I remember that too, except I remember we didn't meet at the playground the first time. We met in a session. We were sitting next to each other at a table and started talking and then ran into each other at the playground, um, which gave us a little more of a relationship, even though we still didn't know each other. Um, and yes, we sat and talked about, I think it was about how do you come up with a title for a session? Well, and I was absolutely in awe of you because, I, you know, we when we learn from each other, we get to, you know, do things. And I'll be honest, I had not ever, attended. this was my first ISTE uh, that I had ever attended. And you were the first school librarian I had ever spoken to at ISTE. And I wanted to see how school librarians fit into that whole dynamic of being at ISTE, but being a school librarian. So I was really excited because I knew what it, whatever it is you were doing, I wanted to replicate, like I wanted to learn from you. And, and the really cool thing is, friends, when I met Robbie, I then, that was, that was a, we probably talked a handful of times. And this is the first time we've seen each other since, and for, but we still cross paths on our virtual PLN and social media all the time. Uh, that's all absolutely true. In fact, I really don't listen to podcasts, but I met Amy and she's doing School Librarians United podcast and I decided to listen to that one. I download it every week, every session that she puts out. I always uh, go through the session notes, even if I don't listen to it, but I listen to it a lot. And I always, always share it with new librarians. I think everybody can benefit from it. 
You know, I'm so curious because you are presenting several times at this conference. Would you give listeners an idea of of that sort of uh, timeline? Uh, when do you apply? Uh, what kinds of uh, topics inspire you? And um, how did you, because, you know, this is a, a ALA, not not a, our, our American Association of School Librarians. So, I mean, you had to put some thought into what kinds of things you wanted to do to present at our national conference. Uh, you know, give us an idea of that timeline. Um, so I'm going to be honest and say that I went to my husband and said, where do you want a vacation this summer? In Philadelphia or Chicago. And he goes, I've never been to Chicago. I said, ALA it is. Um, so once I knew where I wanted to head, I wanted to try to apply to present. You get a discount. I don't get anybody else to pay for me to go to conferences. So a little bit of discount goes a very long way. Um, now then, having said that, I look back. I always keep notes on things that I'm thinking about presenting, have presented in the past, want to refresh. I never do the same one twice exactly the same way. They always change because there's always updated information or just something that didn't work and I want to fix and so on. So I went through my notes when it first came out saying you can apply to present to the ALA. And um, I guess I wanted to go back through and say, what do I need? So in 2016, I created a presentation called Fake or Alternative Facts. And I have updated that many times, but I thought there some other things have come up since then that may move some of the material to a brand new session. And that's where I had found out about Birds Aren't Real maybe a year ago, a little more than a year ago, and was so excited, so excited that's what got me going on this topic. Friends, I'm so excited. Robbie was very generous in sharing out her presentation. You're going to be able to find it in the show notes. Robbie, I can't wait to see your next presentations. And I'm so grateful you're here because uh, I knew that when I saw you on the schedule, I wouldn't have missed this for the world. Amy, I was very excited to actually see pictures of you in uh, social media. And I thought, all right, I'm going to get to see Amy again this time. Have a great rest of the conference. Thank you. You too. Hi, I'm Carolina Santana. I work at Avenues the Word School in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, this is my first time joining the American Library Association conference. I'm really excited to be here. I'm joining lots of different uh, sessions on disinformation, media and information literacy, and I'm having such a great time getting to know amazing people and seeing what people are doing all over the world and getting so many great ideas for new practices that I can implement on my school. And it's just a lot of fun. So I, I'm going to tell you right now, you win the prize for, for traveling as far as you have to come to this conference. I, I'm sure that somebody else has traveled further. But how did you convince your, your administration that this was something they should pay for? Because it's one thing for me to get in my car and drive for five hours. It's another that you flew here. Uh, tell us a little bit about how you did this and uh, and how long it took you to get here. Uh, it took me about 10 hours flying to get here, uh, but I think I'm very fortunate to work in a school that really values professional learning. And the same school has a branch in China, and I have a colleague that flew from China, so I think she wins this. <laughs> she was flying for about 23, 24 hours to get here, but I think uh, the school I work in is like, really trying to make sure that we're all feeling supported and finding new ways to collaborate with the school growth and to offer a great content to our students. And our library program is really respected and embraced. And I know this is not everyone's reality, but I, I know how lucky I am to be where I am. So let me ask, uh, what, what does a typical day look like for you? Do you work with an assistant? Do you teach classes? Uh, you know, how, what does it look like at a, if I walked into your library today? So I'm responsible for grades four to eight. Um, we are a K-12 school and it depends on primary division with grades four and five. I have scheduled weekly library lessons. Sometimes we do read aloud, sometimes some research lessons. It is a PBL school, so it's really easy to find those moments to connect with the teachers and to make sure we have great research integrations. And then secondary division with the students from sixth to eighth grade, uh, because of the PBL structure, we also find some opportunities throughout the semester of joining and showcasing some library resources, uh, finding some ways to connect with reading, 
literacy and I don't have an assistant. I would love to have an intern. <laughs> this is for the record. <laughs> But yeah, it's a lot of things going on. It's a very active school, but we have a great buy-in from the whole community, parents, uh, people from other departments. So lots of things happening at all times, but it's great. So I, I have to ask, what kind of support do librarians and school librarians have in Sao Paulo and in Brazil? I assume there's some sort of national organization. Do you have conferences there where you also feel supported uh, and, and you don't have to get in a plane and, and fly for 10 hours. Absolutely. I think uh, Brazil doesn't have such a strong culture like the United States. We do have some national organizations that are responsible for uh, supporting librarians locally, but the American Library Association is a reference all over the world. And I think uh, having this opportunity to come here and be interacting with people that have such different backgrounds and uh, with the strong culture that the United States has in terms of libraries when compared to Brazil, it's really different. So yeah, I think we have a long way to come in Brazil, but uh, being here is just really nice. We have some local events, but they are just not as big. Well, and I, I can't help but think that when you go back to school and to work that you are absolutely going to incorporate so many of the things that you've brought and there's something contagious when the school librarian and librarians in general sort of share what they've learned. It sort of does raise the profile of what we do everywhere. Yes, absolutely. Yesterday I was joining the session called Meet Me at the Library and they were hosting, uh, they were talking about hosting an evening event for parents and trying to increase like parent buy-in and participation and how this can help like the circulation and just like having families closer to the library. And this is definitely something I want to try to incorporate in our library program. Carolina, I'm so grateful we were able to talk today. I wish you a very happy rest of the conference and a very safe flight home. Thank you so much. Nice to meet you too. So I'm David Atkins Brown, and I am the new uh, manager of Community Library Initiatives at Snow Isle. Um, but I also teach uh, school librarianship classes for Highline College and Seattle Pacific University. Wow. So tell me, what, I mean, have you started your new job and, and what is this going to look like? Well, it's a lot of looking for new things to experiment with. And that is exactly the reason why I come to places like ALA is to like share ideas and get inspired and see what new people are doing or see how I can tweak that one idea to make it fit my community. And that, you know, not every idea is going to fit every single community. And that's what I'm looking for is like, how can I fit things together, make it new and draw people in and speak to them and their needs. So what, what have you, I, I guess, I'm sort of curious, like how have you been able to meet those needs right now, but how are you planning to, what, can you share a little bit about some of the programming that you're thinking about or what kinds of things that you are excited about moving forward when you leave here? I am, for, well, first of all, I'm really going to be excited on one hand for the public library space uh, ideas for myself because I'm looking at like AI. How can I bring that in? How can I make it not scary, but can I also educate the public on it and how to use it? And then I'm going, I spend my time going to like the school librarianship uh, sessions and looking at what people are doing, listening to people's concerns, hearing solutions that come up with like our firsthand from people and being able to wrap that up into my classes as well so that my students are able to see firsthand what those ideas and problem solving solutions are when they get into the field as well. Well, and I'm hoping that, you know, reaching out and building that PLN and connecting with other professionals in the field is something that, that comes up a lot in, in these conversations. That is it. Well, that was, a, I saw you and I was like, wait a second. I, you know, my, my ears perked up and I was like, I've got to get over here. Um, but there's a lot of that just uh, the associate, you know, the relationships that I've built here um, I've become uh, connected to like uh, people at museums as well, um, learning how to like connect librarians into uh, at school librarians into Library of Congress and seeing how they're going to work together. So, you know, and especially last year with it being in D.C., I was able to speak to some people, make those connections and be like, let's talk. 
let's see what we can do together. And then taking home like their little kits and notes and being like, okay, let's slide these all together. Let's weave them together into the classes or into what I'm doing daily in the public library as well. Well, and isn't it always amazing that the willingness that librarians have to share what they do, what they create? I mean, our work product, we end up sharing it with it because we want to make sure that everybody has as much access to it as possible. It, well, let's just say we are really good at open source. And, we, and, and the thing is, is like people, you know, we can cite each other, we can do all these things, but we're still like going, oh, I have an idea how I can like make this work better for, for these needs over here. Because you know, our students are going to be, you're going to run into like the, those students that are, are go, going to run into reading problems and they're just not, not, they're just not connecting at all. And then you're, you're hearing about like that new idea on how to use a graphic novel. And at the same time, you're also hearing about the parents that are like, but that's not really reading. And so I hear other people like, so I did a program like this. I did a, an adult, uh, like a, a parent reading group that included graphic novels. And I'm like, huh, okay, let's, let's talk about this. Let's see how we get the parents to be the ones to start getting involved in those conversations as well and suddenly not being afraid of the book because now they actually have read it. So those are, you know, those are ideas that I'm coming up with and then adjusting, or not coming up with, I'm gaining and then adjusting so that I can like, make something work for people, make something work for my community and my students and help, help make their lives a little bit easier as they reach out to their learning community as well. well. I'm so grateful that you came to the session today and I'm so grateful that you took the time to stop and let me know that you find value in tuning in. And I'm so grateful that our paths cross because this is part of me building my, my connections and building those relationships with people I call upon. So I'm so grateful you stopped by today. Thank you so much. I hope you have a great conference. Thank you very much as well. You too. Take care. My name is Andrea Jamison. I am an assistant professor of school librarianship at Illinois State University. I've been at the university now for about four years prior to working at Illinois State University. I worked as a self-contained classroom teacher for about nine years, and then I spent another nine years as a school librarian. I also have time um, or experience working in public libraries as well as academic libraries. So it's safe to say that I am a lover of libraries. So you and I first crossed paths because you are a friend of Casey Boyd's. And Casey Boyd told us on Clubhouse, hey, hey, everybody, anybody wants to speak to, to Dr. Jameson's uh, class this summer, you know, that would be fantastic. I was like, oh, me, me, me. I love talking to, to students about school librarianship. Would you tell us what classes do you enjoy teaching and, uh, you know, what are you working on right now? Absolutely. So let me say this first. I am still teaching those same courses this summer. So if anyone wants to volunteer to speak to my class, I would greatly appreciate it because I do love bringing in voices from the field for students. I think that, you know, in classes we can teach a lot of the practicum and the theory, but I think it's really important for librarians to hear from practitioners and their experiences. And just to get, you know, not everyone, we don't approach this field the same way. Although we're guided by professional guidelines, but we all have unique experiences relative to the communities that we serve and just various things that just happen in our libraries that I think that we can share those experiences to sort of strengthen our, our role or our profession, uh, professional um, responsibilities as a librarian. So I teach, um, I, I love teaching all of the courses I teach. <laughs> at Illinois State University. So that's for if my administrator or my dean is listening. <laughs> but right now I'm teaching a, a management of uh, school librarianship, which is a wonderful course because within that course, we really talk about the five essential role, uh, roles of a librarian. We talk about a librarian as a fiscal manager, human resources manager, managing resources, as well as um, just managing various aspects of like the programs and collaborating with teachers. And I also teach the organization course, which is more technical, but we get to talk about how books are, are organized on the shelves. We talk about genre 
We talk about just making information discoverable and retrievable within the library with a special emphasis on uh, mitigating any type of barrier that would prevent uh, equitable access to content or resources. I love that. You know, I can't help but notice, Dr. Jameson, you have committed yourself to certain uh, sort of aspects of ALA. You're involved with the ALA leadership. Would you give us an idea of what are the kinds of, of programs and organizations that you have affiliated yourself with and, and really lent your expertise to? Yes, yeah, so right now I am currently the chair of EMART, which is the Ethnic and Multicultural Information Exchange Roundtable. I've been working with EMART as a while. I also work with CSK, which is the Coretta Scott King. Now they are their own roundtable, so I'm excited about that. This year I served as the CSK, uh, the chair of the CSK Breakfast. So uh, that was a, a huge responsibility, and I learned so much, and I really enjoyed working with the the volunteers, everyone that's part of the CSK community is wonderful. I'm also a part of Diverse uh, Book Finder, which is a an organization. It's an excellent organization that really makes diversity or diverse books uh, discoverable within their large collection of um, their large database that they, um, what I really like about Diverse Book Finder is that their emphasis is not on only on just having surface level conversations about diversity, but they really get into the nuances of diversity and help librarians think more about, about not just the representation that exists in like the books, but also how diverse communities, BIPOC communities are represented as well as LGB communities. So I think that's very important. And let's see, I'm also, I used to be an ALA counselor. <laughs> And so I'm, I'm, that's something that I may run for in the future, um, but I had a three-year term. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm involved in anything that is really that the focus is on really advancing multiculturalism and inclusivity and librarianship. I love it. So um, uh, one last question before I let you go. Uh, you work at Illinois State University. For listeners who are tuning in, do... You have an online program, a certificate program, or a degreed program, which, uh, because a lot of our listeners are not in Illinois, uh, but do you offer a program which uh, listeners could attend uh, remotely and earn a certificate or a degree? Yes, we do. So the, the certification program at Illinois State University is a fully online program. And I teach uh, about four of the courses. Right now, you have to take eight courses to matriculate through the program. We're restructuring that, so it will be six courses. But it's very flexible scheduling, uh, particularly the summer classes. But yes, um, it's for the endorsement. And you do, after you take the state test, you are certified. You have the endorsement to work as a school librarian in the state of Illinois. Outstanding. And I'm going to put some links in the show notes. Dr. Jameson, thank you so much for inviting me to join your panel at, at ALA this year. It really made made my day because I'll tell you what, I can now brag that I've, I've presented at, at ALA. But I, I hope you have some fun things planned this summer and, and some time for yourself to, to really relax and enjoy because I, I know you have a very busy, busy year. Thank you, I do. And so I'm taking my son to Hawaii. <laughs> so that's very exciting. I'm looking forward to that. But I'm also looking forward to this work that I think we're all committed to do, which is really promoting the love of literacy, promoting the love of reading, and making sure that all communities um, have a, um, they're represented in libraries. Have a fantastic rest of the conference. Thank you, you too. Friends, don't forget to check out our show notes. You'll find links to all the things that were mentioned in today's conversation, as well as resources that you can use anytime, including our School Librarians United playlist and the discounts offered by our gracious sponsors. If you found this episode helpful, please share it out with your team, your PLN, and on social media. Be sure to follow on your favorite podcatcher so you'll never miss an episode. And if you really like listening today, consider leaving a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Reviews help others find us. One last friendly reminder, use the code UNITED to take advantage of Capstone's generous $20 discount off an order of $100 or more and... Schedule your first Literati Book Fair by July 31st for this fall 2023 and receive a $500 Tidal Wave gift card. As always, there are links in the show notes. 
The topic of our next episode will be teaching preschoolers and my conversation with Patrick Adams and Caroline Laguerre. I hope you will tune in.